Welcome to our episode of Revenue Chat. Today we have part two of our interview with Richard Hasnote, a former professor of the School of Management at Arizona State University and multiple author, including the well-known Proven Practical Innovation that delivers results. He also has the Innovation Best Practices podcast with listeners in 72 countries. He's fortunate to having achieved his dream of running several successful businesses. Richard is going to talk about practical innovation that is going to help you sell more and make more next on Revenue Chat. Hi, everyone. This is Tony Gerso with Revenue Chat brought to you by the book Easy Sales Procedures. With us, back for the second half, we have Richard Hasnote, author of six books, including the popular Proven Practical Innovation that Delivers Results. He also has the Innovation Best Practices podcast with listeners in 72 countries. Richard lived his dream, including a wonderful family that gives him the most happiness, and his roots come from a sales and marketing executive for Procter & Gamble for 16 years and vice president of Gallo Winery for 10 years. Richard was also a professor of the Arizona State University teaching upper-level marketing, innovation, and leadership courses. He now runs Innovate to Grow Experts, a leading front-end innovation consulting company, and is dedicated to helping you and others with proven practical innovation to sell more and make more. You can also call him the innovator. Richard's site is i2ge.com. That's the letter I, the number two. The letter G is in George, and E is in Edward. All right. Get ready for Richard to teach you his proven practical innovation method. The class has started. Everyone be seated. Hello, Richard. How are you? Tony, great to be with you. I'm looking forward to help your listeners become more successful with their innovation. Awesome. Richard, Thank you so much, and I appreciate you having this second show with us because there was so much for everything on the first show. And so it's very appreciated that we have you back. Yeah. Now, for those that are joining us on the second half, Richard, would you fill us in a little more on your roots and how you became an expert in this field? Yeah, I, I'd love to do that. I, As you mentioned, I was at Procter & Gamble for 16 years, and Tony, looking back, what I find – in looking back is that I enjoyed uh, innovation the most and was most successful in my career in in a high variety of uh, businesses and situations at Procter. I was very successful with innovation. And then when I went to the Gallo Winery to become Ernest Gallo's vice president of marketing, um, I also found myself now looking back to innovation as as kind of like a magnet that um, attracted me and it was really served to create the successes that I had there. Uh, so it was clear when I left there that I wanted to pursue that intensely, and that led to teaching innovation at Arizona State University, starting Innovate to Grow Experts, uh, which were, works with, and our experts have worked with large national and international companies to invent major new products. Um, and I also have a highly successful graphic design company called Blue Sage Creative at bluesagecreative.com. So, and so getting into these businesses seemed to be a very natural uh, evolution from my entire career. Very cool and awesome. All right, Richard, let's chat and go over some of these. First thing I'd like to ask you, please, is. If people need more ideas to solve a problem or optimize an opportunity, what is the best way to do that? Yeah, we we are at um, Innovate to Grow Experts are one of the only one or two front-end uh, innovation consulting companies that use a process that generates at least 12 times more ideas than brainstorming. And we talked this at some length in the in the first um, episode. So I'll just cover it in brief form here and then talk a little bit about how you know if an idea has uh, high or low chances for success. But first, what quantum idea generation is all about in generating at least 12 times more ideas. And just so your listeners understand, this 12 times is not a number I made up. There were two research studies conducted at Oklahoma State University in which they ran traditional brainstorming in one cell and quantum idea generation in another cell. And in both studies, 
um, the quantum idea generation uh, approach to generating ideas generated 12 times more ideas than brainstorming. And I want to give a tip, tip to the hat here to Doug Hall, who actually pioneered this process. And my team and I took it to version 2.0 from his version 1.0. So with that as background, there are four things that you need to do to generate at least 12 times more ideas in brainstorming. First, you need to start in bringing a very diverse and talented group into an actual creative session. You need to bring the top ex relevant experts from inside your own business. You need to supplement that with bringing in top external experts um, with relevant expertise but doesn't duplicate what your internal people have. And then third, in those really challenging projects, make sure that you bring in a group uh, like the experts at i2ge.com um, that uh, know how to facilitate creative sessions because knowing how to do that uh, can really create both the quantity of ideas and, more importantly, the quality of ideas that you need. And it's a skill that most companies do not have internally. So diversity is step one. Step two is bring high-level, inspiring stimulus into a creative session. And this is facts, visuals, pictures, trends, all sorts of stuff. And let me just share with your listeners a very um, quick story about how I demonstrate this. When I was teaching at Arizona State University, I would ask my students to take out a pad of paper and write down all the places that they would like to go on vacation. When they were done, I asked them to draw a line under the last one, and then I asked them to go to the back of the classroom uh, where I had laid out hundreds of travel brochures and asked them to look through it if they saw other places that they wanted to go on vacation to add it to the list. We then compared the number that they had before they went back with the number that they had afterwards. And in six years of doing this, and two semesters each year, never got less than a tripling of the number of ideas from what they did when they sat down at their desk. They tripled the number of ideas when they had the stimulus of travel brochures. That's the power of stimulus. So with a diverse group, bring in powerful stimulus. There's five different kinds. And for your listeners who are interested in learning more about this, at the uh, Innovation Best Practices podcast, if you go to um, the first seven episodes, um, you will find that I cover all of these points in some detail in individual episodes. The third thing that you want to do is we know people are equally creative, but they create in very different ways. So you want to know that group that you have in the room, are they left brain thinkers or right brain thinkers? And then you want to use the kinds of creative exercises that are most effective with each group. If they're left brain, you're going to be using a lot more logic and facts and structure. If they're right brain group, you're going to be using more feelings, pictures, and emotions, and chaos in large groups. Uh, approaches to creativity. And the last thing, Tony, that you want to do in, in creating 12 times more ideas is to make sure that you are uh, eliminating fear from the session and you have a sense of high fun. The reason you need to eliminate fear is because it kills creativity. Not stymies creativity, kills creativity. And it comes in a variety of forms. It can be bosses who roll their eyes or put their head down when somebody says a wild idea. You can't have that going on. Because quite frankly, what you need to do is create an environment where wild and wacky ideas can uh, have a safe haven. So the four things you need to do are bring in a diverse group, bring in powerful stimulus, create uh, uh, creativity exercises for left and right brain people, and lastly, make sure that you eliminate fear and have only fun in the session. If you do those four things well, you will get at least 12 times more ideas every single time. It's very consistent and very powerful. I love it. That's very inspiring, and while you were talking, it made me think of Pixar films. I know yes. that they do some of those, and they have these this is a whole story to get into, but if anyone follows how they create their animation feature films and so forth, it's very amazing how they get the, the stimulation, how they get that innovation, and it made me think of it. So very cool. Yeah. Now, the next thing, and this will be new in, in, um, in today's discussion, Tony, is, okay, it's one thing. It, it's, it's critical 
to have a lot of ideas because innovation runs on ideas like a car runs on gasoline. No gasoline in the car doesn't go anywhere. No ideas, innovation is not going to go anywhere. So you need ideas. But the second thing that we bring to people is a deep understanding of what it takes for an idea to be successful. And we chatted a little bit in the previous uh, session and shared the fact that 75% of all new products and services fail within five years, with most of them failing within the first 18 to 24 months. Conversely, only 25% succeed. Now, with that kind of high failure rate, it is helpful if you understand what it takes to double your chances for success from the average of 25% to at least up to 50%, and we know how to do that. What I'm about to share with you are the foundation insights from something called Merwin Technology, M-E-R-W-Y-N. Again, this was pioneered by a good friend and a fellow brand manager at Procter & Gamble at one time, Doug Hall, so I've got to give him credit for this. And he spent six years and $20 million figuring out what differentiated high success ideas from low success ideas. And he identified three things that a message to customers need, needs to have if it's going to be successful. So let me go through them quickly and we can dive deeper as we need to. The three elements are you need to have a, you need to communicate to your customers a very clear and specific benefit. In other words, how does my product or service meet your need? Let me give you a very quick and simple example from my real life. Um, I was going, in, in the years that I was traveling uh, all over the country and as part of my business, I was rushing through an airport and I came to a shoe shine stand and I saw the sign behind the shoe shine guy said, Fast Shoe Shine. And I looked at my watch and I said, boy, I really don't know what he means by fast, and boy, I'm going to tight connection with the flight. So I walked on by. I was back there about nine months later, and he had crossed out fast and written in two-minute shoeshine. So uh -huh. now I didn't have to guess what fast meant. And I either had two minutes or I didn't have two minutes. In this case, I did. And, oh, by the way, I was interested to see if he could do it in two minutes. And he did it just a little bit over two minutes, two minutes and a few seconds. So it was very, very good. So see the power of taking a benefit and making it specific and clear to a customer significantly increases the persuasiveness of your benefit communication. So first you have to have very strong benefit communication. And Doug found that if you have just strong benefit communication, versus weak benefit communication, you could triple your chances for success. Just think of that, Tony. If you know, your listeners now knowing this, if they can craft a very strong benefit statement, they can triple their chances for success versus a weak benefit communication. The second That's thing is, oh, it's very significant, and we know how to do it, which is important. And, and, it, and this is not rocket science, Tony. It really isn't. It passes the common sense test every time. The second thing is, when you communicate a benefit to potential customers, you, get, you need to give people a reason to believe that you can actually deliver the benefit that you just promised. Because in today's world, people are very, very skeptical about what it means, um, about benefit promises that, that uh, companies make. So you need to make your benefit credible. And I'm just going to give you a, a quick example here um, that is a very simple and straightforward. Um, if I'm if I'm in the uh, if I'm a retailer and I'm selling fish and and I say I have a big sign out front that says fresh fish. Well, I guess I look at that and I say fresh fish is better than stale fish, but it doesn't really break through to me. If I take that benefit statement and make it stronger and say it's the freshest fish in town, all of a sudden, if I like fish and these folks say they have the freshest fish in town, then I'm interested, but I'm skeptical. And then they give me this reason to believe. When you sell more fish, it's fresher. We sell more fish than anyone. So all of a sudden, the benefit claim of freshest fish in town, I now have a reason to believe that they actually have that. 
And when you put those two things together, a benefit statement with high credibility, you again have a significant increase in your chances for success. So again, this the first two things are benefits and reason to believe, and the third one is that you need to do is you need to communicate how you are dramatically better than some, most, or all of your competition. And Tony, that's because in 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 the world today, a very real fact is if you want to build your business with an innovation, you are going to have to get customers of competitive products to switch to yours. I don't know how you do it otherwise. Um, so you need to give people a reason to switch from one product to yours. And you need to tell them how it's different and how it's better. And if it's not dramatically better, Tony, we know that habits and practices and loyalty to a brand and all that sort of stuff really keep people there. Let me give you an example that, that I use in uh, when I'm uh, speaking to groups to kind of demonstrate this. I ask from the group, is there a loyal Crest or Colgate toothpaste user? And there, there always is. And I identify them, and let's say it's a Crest user. And I then say, I'm going to play the role of a Colgate brand manager, and I'm going to try and get you to switch from Crest to Colgate. And I've got three products that I hope will get you to switch. First product, my Colgate product will give you 50% more fresh mint taste than your Crest product. Will you switch? I've never, Tony, gotten a yes. The next one is, I have another product that will um, whiten your teeth 50% faster, 50% faster than your Crest product. Will you switch? I've never gotten a Royal Crest user to switch for that. The next one I say is, I've got my third product I have is, it reduces cavities 75% more than Crest. Will you switch? Now, when I get to this point, I've actually had some people say, yeah, I think I would, I think I'd consider doing that. I also get some no's. The point in this is, if you're trying to switch a loyal user from their brand to your new innovation, it takes a big, big difference in a powerful benefit need to get them to switch. If it's only 10, 20, 30 percent like that, they'll say, why waste my time? And they don't, and they don't switch. So, in summary, Merwin Technology tells us you can increase your chances for success if you do three things. You have a very strong, clear, and specific benefit statement. You have a highly credible reason to believe that you can actually do what you're promising to do. And third, that you communicate to people that you have a dramatic difference versus some, most, or all of the competition. And for your listeners who'd like to learn more about each of these, if they go to my Innovation Best Practices podcast and listen to episodes 7 through 12, I dive deeper into each of these um, so that they get a better understanding of what it's all about. But here's the key. If you do these things and you have the product that measures up to be able to do this well, you can double your chances for long-term success by using these understandings. This is the only methodology, and I've been in this business for more than 40 years, Tony. This is the only process that I know that is scientifically based, Merwin technology, and proven in the real world and is something that every one of your listeners can use if they are interested in bringing innovation to an existing company or using it as a startup to double their chances for success. It's that good. It's awesome, Richard. I very much believe it. It makes perfectly clear sense. It's so simple, yet one can instantly tell very effective as well. So thank you for sharing that. Merwin Technology is very cool. As far as innovative approaches, you've taken quite a number on your own businesses. Would you like to uh, tell us some about that, please? Yeah, I, <laughs> this is kind of like if it's kind of like Richard. If you're in the innovation business and you're going to start a new business, shouldn't you use your proven practical um, innovation advice? And the answer is not only yes, but heck yes. So let me give you an example, um, and the example I'm going to give. Um, I'm going to suggest the basic principles here can work for anyone that is an aspiring entrepreneur and wants to start a new business in either the consulting or service business of some kind. It's probably not going to work as well for manufacturing companies and that sort of thing. But the vast majority of the economy is built on service businesses 
And the story I'm about to share with you is one that I think can work for virtually every one of those businesses. Here's the story. And this is a true story um, of serendipity in a way. I have a good friend who um, became president and CEO of a national company headquartered in the L.A. area. And shortly after he became president there, he and I went out to dinner. And in the course of conversation, he told me that he had a graphic internal graphic design group. And he was very unhappy with them and was going to terminate them and get an external company in a traditional way. And I'm at dinner, and maybe I had too much wine, Tony, but I said, <laughs> I said, um, I said Mike, what if I start my own graphic design company and I did two things. One, I got a really key designer that both he and I knew. And two, I started a company that could deliver service better than anyone you've ever had. Would you be interested? He said, of course I would be. And I said, look, I said, we're just developing this on the fly here. But give me 48 hours and I'll get you a proposal. And in the next 48 hours, here's what I did, Tony. I took a very innovative approach to developing the company. The first thing that I know that a client needs in graphic design, and this really applies to any service, so don't just think it's graphic design specific. The first thing they want is absolutely great graphic design. And for that, I needed world-class graphic designers. And I knew if I opened up a shop on any corner in any city, I'd only have limited access to a few of those available folks within driving distance within that city. So I decided very quickly, if I was going to get the quality of graphic designers that I needed, I needed to be a virtual company so that I could attract world-class graphic designers from any place in the world and certainly any place in the United States. And I knew from my experience in business that I knew graphic designers throughout the United States that I had relationships with that I would love to have part of this company. So I immediately, by deciding it was going to be a virtual company and having conversations, I immediately es es established a group of world-class graphic designers. The second thing, Tony, that I had always been a client of graphic design companies, and there were things I liked and things I didn't like. And two of the things I didn't like were I never knew in advance how much a project was going to cost. They said, "Oh, you can't make estimates for creativity, and you can't excel. You, you can't make the creative process speed up." And as a client, I would go, "Oh, give me a break!" But that was their story, and they were sticking to it. So here's what I did: I designed a company with service designed from the client perspective. So I did two things. We're the only graphic design company that makes the 100% promise. We deliver 100% of projects on budget, and we deliver 100% of projects on time. Let me deal with the first one here, on budget. When we get a, a request from a client for a project, we put it out to competitive bid among our groups of designers, and we choose the low bid. So the client knows that we have competitively bid and chosen the low bid from a, from a group of world-class designers. They agree to the budget before we do one ounce of work, so they know what it's going to, be, what it's going to cost, and we give them the 100% promise of delivering. We deliver 100% of projects on budget. That, we are the only company that does that in the graphic design business that I'm aware of. And the second thing was we guaranteed that we would deliver 100% of projects on time. So when we begin a project, we agree on the timeline, and we deliver to that timeline. Now, if the scope changes, the budget changes, and the timing changes, but all that is then agreed to again. So you step back, and here's what you've got, Tony. For those, of, those, pe those people listening who are in the service business, here are the principles. I'm going to step away from graphic design. If you create a virtual company, you can gain access to tremendous amounts of expertise that you can't if you're in a brick-and-mortar operation. And that is terribly important. The second thing is design your company from the client perspective, just as I did, 100% on time and 100% on budget. Now, I want to step back and take a look at that entire package of things. Here's what happened, Tony. If In the graphic design business, most graphic design companies, even large, successful graphic design companies, have their business populated primarily by small, local, and even regional clients. Blue Sage Creative, 100% of its business is with national clients. And that's because 
we have world-class designers with a high service and a high value model put together. I could never do that if it weren't a virtual company that allowed me to tap into my network of really world-class designers. So here's how you apply that if you're someone else. If you want, if you want to look big and highly capable to potential customers, create a virtual company, tap into your own personal network of experts in the area that you're in as independent contractors working for you, and and if you need to expand that network, get recommendations from people that you know of other people so that you get highly vetted talent, whether it's financial services, graphic design, uh, marketing services, whatever it is. When you do that, Tony, when you go to a client, instead of being a one-person operation, you now look like a 10- to 15-person operation that has very, very robust capabilities, better than any other company that they're going to be looking at for your services. So the virtual model and the independent contractor model enables you to look like a very big, capable business and get the really big clients from day one. And so this is something that I would urge each of your listeners who are thinking of being entrepreneurs and want to go about it, do the same thing. I, one closing thought, and I'll be interested in your thoughts on this. I did the same thing for Innovate Pro Expert. If, if your listeners go to i2g.com, they can look at the experts that are a part of our team, and the same thing happened there. I mean, I am the sole full-time employee of i2g.com, but when you take a look at the experts that are a part of our team, that has enabled um, me to over the years to get only major national and international clients like Nestle, Kimberly Clark, Clorox, Procter Gamble, and things of those nature from day one to me. And that's because the capability that I have by creating this virtual model with experts that are a part of my network makes me look like this very big, very robust, very capable business, capable of getting these big companies. So I'll shut up and... You can keep on going. This is very inspirational and mesmerizing. It's very, very on point. It is such a much larger, greater sphere when you go virtual and it allows yep. for a lot more people to work that are very good and it allows for being able to scale to any size. So it's a whole different model by this virtual model and I do see it as very success. I come, of course, from many, many, many years in brick and mortar but of course, with the advent of the internet and all of the technology that's out, it seems for most, for for the right fit, for design, for various sales and marketing activities that I've been engaged in, the virtual model seems to be the best because of the all the dimensions and depths you can go and the latitude and the variety, the diversity. So that's that's quite amazing. And how long has that company been in? What is that, Blue Design? Could you give us that name again? Yeah, Blue Sage Creative at bluesagecreative.com. We're in our third year, and we've been having double and even triple-digit growth every year, year to year. So it's a very powerful model. And let me mention one other thing that I think will also appeal to your listeners. This model gives you virtually guaranteed profitability. Guaranteed profitability. Here's why. If you, as the owner of the company, are the only full-time employee and you have this network of independent contractors, you only have to pay other people when you have a project and you hire the independent contractors and you get paid by the client. So the only time you're paying other people is when you're getting paid by a client. And the overhead for being a virtual company, I can tell you, versus brick and mortar is dramatically lower, helping oh, yeah. you to deliver high value. So this is a business model that gives you virtually guaranteed profitability from day one. I'm not sure there's too many others that do that, Tony. Yeah, for for design, this is, this is incredible. Uh, depending on the right design, it's the model as opposed to actually this could even be used for, for local businesses that need anything designed. The more you think about it, the more the virtual model is, is a great fit. So very, very clever. 
Yeah, well, it and, actually works, Tony, with any consulting business, um, whatever you're consulting in, whether it's financial services, manufacturing efficiency, supply chain, HR, whatever it is, whatever consulting service uh, that somebody might be looking at, this model uh, has great possibilities uh, in any consulting or service model. As I said earlier, it doesn't work in manufacturing because you need a bunch of people working together and you can't work with you know, an independent contractor world in that particular space. But in consulting and services, financial services even, uh, this model can work extremely well. I love it, Richard. It's awesome. Good stuff. Now, on the subject of innovation, which is, of course, the subject of this interview, most people, when they think of innovation, Richard, they think of, okay, I'm going to improve this product. And I see that a lot on the shelves at the grocery stores, by the way. My favorite products disappear, and now it's something different, and I wonder why. But people think that that's better. What other types of innovations are there that can make a big difference? Because it's not just improving a product all the time. Yeah, no, you're exactly right, Tony. You're exactly right. And I want to give a – I'm going to talk about the some of the 10 different types of innovation. And um, a, a guy who I have tremendous respect for by the name of Larry Keeley, K-E-E-L-E-Y, uh, of the Doblin Group in Chicago, uh, he's written a book on the 10 types of innovation. And it is one of my two favorite books in the whole innovation area. And I read just about everything that's got the word innovation associated with it. And Larry... Uh, in this book, The Ten Types of Innovation, really opened my eyes. And you're right. There is uh, the types of innovation that we're most familiar with are product innovation, like making it more effective, making it faster, making a new product that delivers new benefits. And that is one of the ten types. The second most common type that many people might be familiar with is business model, which is how how and why you choose the prices that you do. And let me just give you a quick example of how of what a business model is. In the software business, uh, you can find companies that have two dramatically different business models. The business model for some companies is they will sell their software to a client company for a price, and it's just like you've bought toothpaste. You've got it. It's now yours. Good luck. Um, Godspeed going forward. Other companies sell a similar software product, but at a far lower price, but they connect it with a long-term service contract. And it is that long-term service contract where they really make money. So two very different service models. The last model I'll share with you, which people are familiar with, is, is what's called the Gillette business model. Gillette will give, give away sometimes the handle for shaving uh, or sell it at a very low price and then turn around and charge rather good prices for blades. So their business model is get you in with a handle at very little or no, no cost sometimes, and then the business model where they make money is on selling the blades time after time after time. And that's a very specific, that's an example of business model, how you price your product and how you tend to make money. Okay, so business model innovation is the second one that people are pretty familiar with. I'm just going to give you a couple of others to kind of illustrate some things that I think people are probably pretty familiar with. You can create a product system with complementary products and services. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, at one time, Microsoft was selling a word processing software, was selling spreadsheet software, and selling them as individual products. And then they changed their business model. They changed it to where they bundled together uh, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, and, and, and other uh, programs at various times. So a, creating a product or system of bundled products that consumers buy all of them at one time is exactly an example of how you create complementary products in a, in a group to have innovation. Apple did the same thing, Tony. They, when they came out with their um, iPhone, they, they coupled hardware with software, the app, and connection to the Internet through your iPhone. And that created a distinct competitive advantage for them. So a third type of innovation is how you create complementary products and services in a very innovative way. The third, 
the fourth way that I'll share with you here is uh, another form of innovation is how you support and amplify the value of your products and services. Let me just give you a couple of examples here. Um, Hyundai brought great innovation to the car business in the service area when they went to a 100,000 mile warranty where everyone else was at about a 50,000 mile warranty. And that innovation of a warranty or support system took that company from being a rather sleepy Korean company into, into being one of the fastest growing uh, car brands in the United States now for years. In a similar vein, L.L. Bean, with its support system of its guarantee, um, which essentially says, paraphrasing, if anything goes wrong at any time for any reason, boy, now that's a guarantee I love. If anything goes wrong at any time for any reason, that guarantee has been one of the things that has long-term distinguished uh, L.L. Bean in a very innovative way from its competition. So those are, I've, I've just mentioned, four of the ten different types of innovation that Larry talks about. But the point here I'm trying to make is, and I urge people to read Larry's book, Ten Types of Innovation. Uh, I also have a podcast on, on the top, actually three podcasts, including an interview with Larry uh, that people can listen to on the Innovation Practices podcast. Um, but this really opened my eyes, Tony. I had never quite thought of it this way. And now in the Innovation Practice Network, I look for how we're going to explore at least three or four different types of innovation um, as we work through innovative solutions to a client need. So very powerful perspective. It really opens up the avenues to create strong, positive differences versus competition uh, in ways that are really remarkable. That's awesome, Richard. I highly encourage everyone to listen to your podcast and to get that book. And I think uh, hats off to you to actually have an interview with the author. That is quite amazing. We do have a few more minutes. In just a short little while, we're going to go over some quotes. But if you would kindly like to give us a few more of your innovation tips, that would be awesome. Yeah, let me, and, and I'm just going to build a little bit on this 10 different types and, and kind of give you an example. And um, I'm going to give you the example of Henry Ford and his Model T. Not that I was around on planet Earth when that happened, to be clear, but, um, but uh, Ford, Henry Ford had some very major innovations in multiple areas. He was known for having a very low price, cost-efficient Model T that I was surprised to learn could be repaired with parts from your local hardware store, and that was a highly innovative service approach at that time when cars were being made. He's known for having another innovation called the assembly line um, of, of people working a car through various stages of development. Another form of innovation is creating an exceptionally talented and well-trained group of people in the company, like Google does, like Procter & Gamble does. Well, what he did, Tony, was he paid all of his workers over the age of, um, over the age of 20 twice the minimum wage at that time. One of the best paying manufacturing jobs in the United States from day one because he knew that he wanted to attract and train high quality people because he wanted a car product that would be enduring. So there's just three types of innovation that he brought to the car business, namely easy to service. You can go down to the hardware store and get parts to an assembly line that made assembling the product far more consistent and higher quality and more cost effective. And third, by assembling a group of people that were more talented and experienced than any other of their competitors. And quite frankly, as a result, Ford Motor Company is, there were probably 30 or 40 car brands back in that time, Tony. And Ford is one of the few surviving ones in large part because it was as innovative as it was. Wow, I did not know that about the, hey, you can fix your car from parts at the local hardware store story. <laughs> That's pretty yeah. cool. Are you sure yeah. you weren't around back then? <laughs> no. Um, no. I, maybe in spirit. Maybe in there spirit. There you go, Johnny. in spirit. There you go. <laughs> but as we probably know, 
the first thing I think of when I think of Henry Ford, his claim to fame, his bi- biggest innovation of all times is the V8 engine. Yeah, in many ways. It was, um, I mean, Ford started in a, uh, as kind of like an innovation incubator on day one, and they continued. Uh, and you still see it today. I mean, they are, um, they were one, one of the leading companies in the mass market in bringing technology into the vehicle uh, today. And, and on the Ford F-150, um, they are the first uh, pickup truck to bring aluminum uh, bodies into that type of vehicle for both cost savings and also improved gas efficiency. Uh, it's a, and it, it's a bold innovation because in the large pickup truck, the F-150 and F-250 and 350 world, um, these are these are vehicles that are sold on toughness and strength, and and going in the direction of aluminum has posed a significant risk for them in some regards, but they've they've prospered very nicely with it. That's right. And one thing behind the scenes about Ford, and what what kept him ahead of the competition and survive and become the mainstay of the country was his mastermind group. He had, I believe Edison and some other notables and they regularly got together, bantered off ideas off off each other, went over innovation, helped each other. And that was all based, I believe on the principle of innovation. They kept looking for good ideas that would make and and excel them and take them beyond and and it did. Yeah, I mean, I mean that Tony is a great example of what we what I was talking about earlier in terms of bringing in a highly diverse and very talented group. Uh, and that's what you just described as a very diverse and talented group of people. When you get them together, combustion happens in terms of really remarkable ideas. And and Henry Ford and the and these other top inventors back in those days were were very opportunistic and and very creative and clever and in how they were able to, you know, have sort of group creativity and very powerful stuff. I appreciate you sharing that. Sure. It's quite a story. I don't, I don't have it all in my memory right now to just go over the whole thing, but I've studied some of this in the past and it's amazing what he's done and all his yeah. successes, the assembly line, the workers, how he took care of workers. It was just very amazing. And yes, he stood out as the best. It was I believe at one time the largest company or one of the largest companies in the world and for motor company, I mean, the government will bail them out and has bailed them out when they've had trouble. It's, it's, it's a mainstay of the country. Yeah. Although interestingly enough, the last time the government had to bail out companies, they bailed out general motors and Chrysler, but Ford said, no, thank you. Yes, they did it on their own bootstraps. Yeah, they did. I believe so. I believe I seem to recall a statistic that the Ford truck sells is sells more vehicles than any other vehicles in the world. This was at least a couple of years ago. I don't know what it is now, but that's a very staggering statement to make even for a few years ago. Well, actually, Tony, you're right. In fact, you're, I think you're right for over a decade, if not two decades, that the Ford F-150 pickup truck has been, has outsold every car and every other truck model in the United States of America for at least a decade. I know when I first saw that, I was absolutely amazed. I think it's probably more in the United States because trucks are not as big a thing in Europe and, and Asian co- countries as they are here. But yeah, it is amazing that uh, pickup trucks are the number one selling vehicle. Yes, it is. I see so many on the road. All right, Richard, we're going to do something unique as we did the last time on the first half. I'm going to do something new here on Revenue Chat to add another dimension to my show. I'm going to innovate. It's becoming successful already. I pulled out some inspirational quotes from famous people about innovation and I would like to read these out and get your comments on them, please. Love to. All right, here we go. The first one, of course, Albert Einstein. And he said, to raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard old problems from a new angle requires creative imagination and marks real advance in science. It really does, and he hit on a number of points there, and that is 
we really need to change, if we want to innovate, we really need to change our relationship with what are, whatever it is we're trying to innovate. And let me just share that with you. We can be a user of a product, whether it be a razor blade or an automobile, and in, and we see it from the perspective of if it's a car, does it reliably get me from point A to point B day after day? But if we then change our perspective and want to innovate, we need to look at it from a perspective of how can I make it better? Remember my definition of innovation in the first part. I said innovation, the way I define it is action to make something better. Okay? I love so that. With, with that definition, simple definition of innovation, you, if you then, instead of looking at the vehicle as something that gets you from point A to point B, you then all of a sudden start looking at it through a different lens. And it's that different lens of how can I make it better? When you just ask that question, it immediately, just that little first step, it immediately starts open up, opening up innovation possibilities. So you're quoting one of the people that I am, I think is one of the most brilliant and insightful people, and I think that's a great quote. Cool. Thank you. This next quote is from a fellow mastermind friend of Henry Ford, who I believe has one of the most highest number of patents ever issued, I think second only to Benjamin Franklin. I'm not sure. I know Benjamin Franklin had the most number of patents ever. But this person is a genius beyond genius and beyond genius. And, of course, that's Thomas Alva Edison. Yep. And his, his quote on innovation is amazing, very simple. He said, there's a way to do it better. Find it. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, I, I mean, here's my version of that that I've been using for a, a number of years. The statement I make when I approach something is, there must be a better way. Let's go find it. It's just that, you know, you, you turn on your curiosity, you turn on your intention to make something better. And it's it's in many ways it's almost that simple. Now there's things you need to do, but that's the mindset that you need that Edison talked about. Yep, very cool. Here's another from a very famous poet and I believe philosopher, Henry David Thoreau, who said, The world is but a canvas to our imaginations. Yeah, and that's said from somebody um uh who was a great poet. And I think he was an artist. And I, you know, I here's two people that I admire that I have zero skill, Tony. Um, I admire the imagination of possibilities that painters have, and whether they be realists or further out sort of things, what they can do with their imagination and innovative thoughts to to bringing to art forms is just absolutely amazing to me. The other the other people that I admire so much because it can be so inspiring and so uplifting is music. I mean, I can't sing worth a darn, but I sure can appreciate people who have musical ability, whether it's voice ability or playing an instrument. Um, and I think that's, you know, he, he, Thoreau was back in the area. I grew up in, in the Boston area and Walden Pond and all of that. And um, he was a naturalist um, and a number of other things. But the imagination and innovation that people bring to poetry and art and music, um, I think, is highly commendable. And those really are um, innovative uh, vehicles for people uh, to help uh, bring new life to those particular mediums, which I admire greatly. Here, here, I totally hear you on that and totally agree. I am not an entertainer, yet I truly <laughs> love an artistic, musical representation of all forms, of all expressions. So, yes, totally with you. Yeah, and, next, and, and probably, go ahead. It, 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 before we go on the next one, it just came to mind. Um, one of the most innovative people in the entertainment business that we, we lost in the last year was Robin Williams. And to see, oh, him, yes. to see him innovating, if you will, on the spot uh, with whatever stimulus he had in front of him, a person, an article of clothing, a subject, whatever it was, uh, the imagination 
that he had. And then, it, and and I agree with you, I'm not an entertainer by any stretch of the imagination, but he was then able to power that with his entertainment ability, uh, just absolutely breathtaking. Yes, and sad what happened, but yes, just yeah. one of the most brilliant comics, comedians, and an inspiration for such a long, long time. Amen. Amazing person. Amen. I wish his spirit well. Yes, amen. Yep. Here is another poet and philosopher, very well known, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he said, in every work of genius, we recognize our once rejected thoughts. I love that. <laughs> so poetic, so thoughtful, so insightful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it, 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 it is. In fact, I've got um, I'm, I've got a podcast called um, Creating New Ideas Out of Old Ideas, interestingly enough. Um, and it's those rejected ideas that were rejected at one time that when you go back and revisit them and see them through a new lens and a new perspective and a new time in history, uh, that all of a sudden, many of them, not all of them for sure, but many of them can become intensely relevant and great solutions. Um, Steve Jobs uh, had a great quote, and I'm just going to paraphrase here. He said, people who are highly creative when they're complimented on their creativity uh, will often be very humble and say, you know, I didn't really do anything. I just, I just saw this and I saw that and I connected them and all of a sudden I had a big idea when I had two small ideas. And all I did was connect the dots. And Wow. Yeah, and, and in many ways, I'm, I know in my own personal life, um, some of the biggest innovations I've had are when, I, when it's the process I call connecting the dots. Well, I know this, and I know this, and I've seen them as separate, but if they come together, whoa, boy, now there's a big idea. And um, so it's, it's an interesting process. So true, so true. It makes me think of the Beatles, one of the, um, John Lennon's dictates to the recording people was do not throw anything away. And he would have little bits of tapes here and there. And he learned that he shouldn't throw things away because they could be used for something later. And I seen, and I recall on the story of Abbey Road, which I think is, is their biggest achievement, Abbey Road, the last song, Her Majesty, that mm. wasn't even submitted to the people to put into the album. It was just a tape line on the floor, and it was just thrown in by the whoever. I, I forgive me, I don't know the words. Whoever it is that puts it puts the album together, he picked it up yeah. as an afterthought, threw it on at the end, and that was just something that you know it was. They rejected it. They you know yeah. like I'll oh, skip that you know. So yet it became it's a, it's a very popular, powerful piece of music. Anyway. Yeah, that would have been George. That, that would have been George Martin, who was the producer for the Beatles, and right. uh, who is who's who's you know gets a lot of credit for their creativity as as part of that team. And uh, they are uh, my favorite musical group of all time. So, uh, here, here. And, and talk about innovative things they did to the music business and Sergeant Pepper and and Yellow Submarine and everything that they did and the. Um, you, you see where George Harrison went with all things must pass and all that, and where John Lennon went, you know, give peace a chance and everything. It's just um, th their innovation inspired a generation. Many generations to come, Richard. Oh, yes. It, yeah. it, it, amazing. To me, every song sounds so different, especially from the latter half of their group. Yeah. Um, just amazing stuff. Yes, so good. All right. Well, drum roll. We're going to do the last quote, who is someone that we, we both share a high affinity for and have spoken before in the, in the press show, and that is Mr. Steve Jobs. Yep. And he said, be a yardstick of quality. Some people aren't used to an environment where excellence is expected. Uh, <laughs> I, love uh, I love it. I, it's I mean, if you go back to what we talked in the first episode about raising the bar to being dramatically better 
and holding that as a standard that you'll go to market when you get dramatically better. To change language here, you'll go to market when you have true excellence. And I will just add one other thing to to the excellence, that, and that is that Steve Jobs, I think, did so well. He delivered great products with great power and great complexity, but they were always delivered with a very simple way of making it work. He believed in the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. So true, so true. And as we said in the first show as well, his brilliance is relatively unparalleled. It's just amazing, amazing what he did yeah. and his products. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, we right, have another guy on the, yeah, yeah. We, just one last thing. We have another guy on the planet who's doing some of that right now, and his legacy is not completely written, a guy called Elon Musk. Uh, with yes. Tesla and the SpaceX oh, yes. and, and Solar City um, innovations, uh, he, he, a very big thinker. So. Yes, yes, I love it. I, I love the growth of Tesla, and it's inspiring knowing what what potential they have. I love it. Yeah. Well, good. And that was fun. And I thank you so much for your r- input, Richard. We are close to wrapping up. Is there anything else you would like our audience to know about, please? Yeah, just a couple of things. Uh, they, as again, on the Innovation Best Practices podcast, they can go to i2g.com slash podcast. Uh, my book, in, uh, Proven Practical Innovation That Delivers Results, is available at Amazon in paperback and Kindle only. It's priced below my break even. And if people want to contact me directly, I love hearing from listeners. My email is richard at i2ge.com. Sounds fantastic. Awesome. Well, I love it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Richard. It's been awesome again to have you back on for the second half. I loved it. It was great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Pleasure. And again, everyone, Richard's site is i2ge.com. That's the letter I, the number two, the letter G is in George, the letter E is in Edward, i2ge.com. Check it out. Listen to all of Richard's podcast. That is the innovator, folks. That's uh, almost as good as it gets. I I would say it's as good as it gets, but I don't think Richard would like that. So I'm going to say the word almost, and it's not a slight, so you understand me. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, and stay tuned to our next show on Revenue Chat. We are going to have best-selling author Chris Kennedy, who is quite the phenomenon. He self-publishes his own books and sells them hand over fist, with 40,000 copies sold last year alone. Chris is so successful that he wrote a book and helps aspiring authors get their books written and sold. His big dream is to sell a million copies and he's well on his way. We are going to chat on how to help you get the book out of your head, into stores, and sold on the next episode of Revenue Chat. This is Tony D'Urso brought to you by Easy Sales Procedures. Get the book Easy Sales Procedures for you and all your business contacts at Tony. D-U-R-S-O dot com. All right. Until next time, and remember, you can make life better for yourself and everyone. Choose wisely. Hi, this is Tony D'Urso, author of the new book, Easy Sales Procedures. You know, in my career, I've made impressive record-breaking sales forays into real estate, collectibles, insurance technology, and other varied industries. My accomplishments include raising $3.25 million in a six-month period. Now, despite what we've been told, sales is an art. There are sales procedures that can be applied precisely as a science. But in essence, it's truly an art. There are fundamentals that you need in place that will help you with your sales, marketing, and business. Get easy sales procedures to help put your business into proper perspective. You know, too many people seem to make sales complicated. Hey, it's easy. All you need are some basics. In three words, open, agree, and get. That's it. That's easysalesprocedures.com. This book will endow you with the simple truths at the core of being a sales master and also contains salesman training drills that when practiced 
demonstrate how to interest any person in anything. These simple procedures can be applied by anyone from any walk of life because in modern day society, every person is involved in interesting or selling someone something. That's Easy Sales Procedures. Get your copies now at a low price from EasySalesProcedures.com. Order enough for all your employees too. Here's to volume sales success for your life and business.